Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. I'm Bob Brownice, a professor of law here at GW Law School and co-director of the Intellectual Property Law Program. Uh, and welcome to Don't Fence Me In, the Meets and Bounds of Copyrightable Musical Expression. Uh, we have three great panelists on this program, Peter Anderson, uh, Charles Cronin, and Joseph Fishman, as well as me. Um, each of us will be giving an opening presentation, and then we'll have time for a conversation between us and for taking questions from the webinar audience as well. So let me introduce each of the panelists, and then we're going to get started with presentations in alphabet uh, alphabetical order. Um, Peter Anderson is a partner in uh, Davis Wright Tremaine's Los Angeles office and has four decades of experience in copyright and entertainment litigation. Uh, initially, his practice focused primarily on representing plaintiffs in copyright infringement cases in the movie industry. Uh, and for example, he represented the plaintiff in the rear window case, Stewart versus Aubins, uh, which he argued to the US Supreme Court. Since then, he's also represented record companies, music publishers, and recording artists, which has grown to a substantial portion of his practice. He was lead counsel in the Stairway to Heaven litigation, uh, winning a jury verdict of non-infringement, uh, followed by the en banc decision of affirmance in Skidmore versus Led Zeppelin in the Ninth Circuit. And he successfully defended, for example, uh, The Weeknd, Gwen Stefani, Stefani, Farrell Williams, uh, Little Nas X, Green Day, and others. He's a graduate of the UCLA Law School and has been named a top music lawyer by Billboard magazine in each of the last three years. Uh, this year, he was named by Billboard magazine as one of the music industry's most influential persons. He's a frequent speaker and panelist, like now, on music litigation issues. Um, Charles Cronin. Uh, Charles is a musician and attorney in Los Angeles. He is the project director of the Music Copyright Infringement Resource, now hosted here at GW Law. That was a project that he established while a graduate student at Berkeley uh, in 1997, and he continues to oversee that project. Uh, he is a visiting scholar here at GW Law School and an adjunct professor at the Claremont Graduate University of Claremont Colleges. Uh, he received his BA from Oberlin, that's the conservatory part, his JD from American University, an MA and PhD from Stanford, uh, an MA in Information Systems at Berkeley. And I, could, I feel like I could just keep rattling off um, various uh, degrees. Wonderful. Joseph Fishman uh, is a professor of law at Vanderbilt University, uh, where his research focuses on intellectual property, uh, particularly its relationship to creativity and the creative process. Uh, his recent scholarship has covered such legal issues as infringing similarity between songs, the role of expert witnesses in music copyright litigation, a judge's definition of musical originality, and trademark issues related to sound recordings. His work has appealed, uh, appeared in leading journals, including NYU, University of Pennsylvania Law Review, uh, and particularly, I think, relevant to this discussion, the Harvard Law Review, uh, a 2018 article called Music as a Matter of Law. He earned his AB magna cum laude from Harvard College with a joint major in music and religion, uh, his MPhil in musicology from the University of Cambridge, and his JD cum laude from Harvard Law School. After law school, he clerked for Judge Jeffrey R. Howard at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and for uh, Judge Miriam Goldman Cedarbaum of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. He then practiced as an associate of Judge Aaron Block. Um, so uh, all that ha introduction stuff uh, having gotten out of the way, uh, let me turn the floor over to Peter Anderson, who will give the first presentation. Okay, well, focusing on the uh, the title, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I, I really appreciate it. Um, focusing first on the, the the title, the meets and bounds of, of music and, and specifically in, in music uh, litigation, I mean, it's just crucial. And the what we've seen over the last seven, eight, nine years, at least in the Ninth Circuit, is a real attempt to define what's meaningful and what's meaningless in, in music. And you know, we can go back, for example, to Blurred Lines, where there wasn't a single note that was shared by the two songs, but based on feel and style, which aren't protected, um, there was a, a judgment for the, the gay family. Um, the Stairway to Heaven case really was a turning point and um, identified specific things that I think anyone with a music background would agree are not protectable, a descending chromatic scale, 
a series of three notes. And that's been carried on in the um, uh, Gray versus Hudson case, where the district court took a verdict for the plaintiff away from the jury, and it was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit, which, among other things, said you cannot protect a chord progression, you cannot protect a series of eighth notes, you know, in two different tones, um, and you cannot protect atmosphere and all these things that were really at the heart of the jury's ruling in blurred lines, where they just, uh, from all accounts, were just really enraptured by the, the timbre, the tone color, the instrumentation, even though they uh, did hear uh, re-recordings, they just couldn't get away from the, the unprotectable elements of the songs being the same. So I don't know if you have questions about that, but that's really, I think, the, the driving force now. I, I know that uh, uh, Professor Cronin's, one of his points is that we should really be looking at melody. And that, of course, was one of the points that was made in the in the Stairway to Heaven on bank uh, court in the several Amica briefs. Uh, unfortunately, the Ninth Circuit didn't bite on that. But really, we should be talking about melody. We shouldn't be talking about a one, four, five chord progression or, or, or similarity in pitch sequences. That said, most of the cases I have, the principal claim is similarity in pitch sequences, even though sequence in Rock of Ages is exactly the same as the, the pitch sequence in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and no one would think they're the same. Okay, we continue later from Beth's panel. Well, I guess that means me, uh, <laughs> since I'm next up, and um, I uh, I will uh, defend uh, a a kind of holistic uh, approach to um, copyrightable musical expression, uh, and so let me run through that. Uh, and the first thing I need to do is share a screen so we get some um, slides up here. Okay. Um, so, uh, as you can see, the, the, the title of this presentation is Should the Musical Word Copyright Be Limited to Certain Elements? Um, and uh, this draws on a, um, uh, an article that I wrote many years ago uh, in 2014, um, and uh, I, my, I don't think my opinion has changed very much since then, uh, but let me kind of run through it, right? We, we all know that uh, music can be analyzed into many elements, pitch, duration, uh, timbre, which could be, uh, which can be sort of further broken down on pitch sequences, uh, melody, I think, is a sort of subset of pitch sequences, a beat, tempo, meter, rhythm, harmony, tonality, texture, structure. These are all intertwined in any particular piece of music. Um, and the question is whether uh, when we are protecting a musical work in copyright, um, do all of these elements enter in, uh, or uh, is there some subset of them or some one that we should focus on um, when, we're, when we're thinking about infringement? Um, why would we want to take a holistic view? And so I want to just sort of uh, uh, think about the, the general case, uh, which um, uh, you know starts out with, well, what's the what's the general purpose of copyright? Um, and uh, this this is sort of drawn. This this formulation uh, is uh, drawn from Judge Jerome Frank's um, opinion in Arnstein versus Porter. Right. So copyright protects. Uh, the author's financial reward uh, from, uh, uh, whoops, sorry, I just need to um, get these, get this out of the way so I can actually, people can see the slides uh, for now. I can do that. Uh, okay, thanks. So, you know, copyright protects the author's financial reward uh, from an original work. 
Um, how does it do that? It does so by protecting the work as against other works that are substantially similar. I think we should have occasion um, to discuss what what that means, um, uh, because I think that we'll, like, we'll see that that sort of um, is an important uh, aspect uh, of all of this. Um, I think that our perception of music, and hence whether two musical works are substantially similar, is holistic. It takes into account all musical elements. And so the syllogism then ends with, well, therefore, copyright should extend to all elements of a musical work. Doesn't mean that copying one of those elements um, is uh, infringement. And that goes back to what we mean by substantially similar. Um, but um, th this is sort of a reason why we would not want to uh, rule out any particular element um, of, uh, of musical work. And this is just a quote from Einstein versus Porter, which, which sort of um, lays out that approach to, uh, to the, the rationale for copyright. Um, uh, I think both Charles and, uh, and, and, and Joe are uh, quite familiar with uh, a um, piece that was published back in 2011 by Jamie Lund, um, and um, in which she conducts this series of experiments and in which she, she varies the style and instrumentation of accompaniment to uh, a melody. And when she does that, uh, the experimental subjects find the melodies kind of more or less similar, um, depending on the, the way they're embedded in the whole musical work. Um, her conclusion, uh, and, and it, 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 may, it may well be uh, Charles's conclusion as well, we will see, is don't play jury sound recordings, right? Because they, it distorts their judgment. Um, and my conclusion, I think, is that uh, musical, musical perception and enjoyment is holistic, uh, and that isolating one element is artificial. Um, can playing a sound recording be prejudicial? You're, if you don't have the substantial similarity test right, then I think the answer is yes. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, I think the answer is probably no. Um, so you know, think about this in context uh, with other kinds of, of, other kinds of um, copyrightable works. Right? So like music, visual art can be analyzed into many elements. Right? Traditionally, line, shape, form, value, space, color, texture, uh, all um, are part of uh, visual works. Um, lots of visual works of uh, visual art uh, uh, combine all of those elements, right? Um, we could think about a uh, view of visual art in which we say, well, visual art is really essentially about line, and that's all we were, we will copyright it. So here I have a, uh, an illustration in which I, you know, first desaturated uh, the self-portrait of, uh, of Vincent van Gogh, and then lined it, right? And we say, well, that's the, we should be looking just at that uh, lined version on the right, because um, visual art is really essentially about line, not about anything else. Um, but we don't do that, right, in visual art. We, we look at it holistically. Um, you know, same thing about literature. We can think about many elements of literature, in works of fiction, we can think about character, plot, setting, theme, point of view, conflict, tone, narrator, and genre, and some others, right? When we just think about the um, structure of, uh, of, uh, of literary works and of poetry in particular, we can think of elements like rhyme, alliteration, assonance, consonance, rhythm, and meter. Um, we don't focus, uh, we don't limit ourselves to any one of those or subset when we're thinking about literary works. Uh, we consider all of them. Uh, and so, for example, right, when we consider a Shakespeare sonnet, we wouldn't like strike out all the rhymes because they're not part of, uh, of what is protected by copyright. Um, we think about the whole thing um, as a whole. Right? So with that as a background and thinking um, you know, about uh, music, I kind of now want to turn to uh, a variety of reasons, think about a variety of reasons why we might want to, in music, protect only some elements. Right? We might, might want to be narrower in, um, in the case of musical works. Uh, and I'm going to present eight of those, I think, and, and then um, 
uh, think about my reactions to them. So the first one is that, um, you know, historically, uh, when before sound recordings, when we only had um, a, very, a variety historically of uh, systems of written notation, um, there were some elements that could be fixed and therefore preserved and transmitted with greater precision and detail than others. Uh, and if we think of fixation as being important to copyright, which it is, being able to preserve and transmit, um, you know, then written notation um, preserved certain elements like relative pitch, duration, and structural elements with more precision and detail. I wouldn't say it doesn't preserve any of the others. It does have means for expressing things like dynamics and timbre, right? We're choosing instruments, we're, we're presenting other instructions in written notation um, and tempo, but definitely with less precision and detail than pitch duration and, and structural elements. Um, and we relied on real-time human performance for the final audible rendition. Right, so in that kind of technological world, uh, we can see why music copyright might be focusing on the, uh, the written score. Um, we're not in that world anymore, right? Sound recording technologies now preserve all elements with great precision and detail. Um, the Copyright Act now explicitly permits fixation of musical works in sound recording, not just in visible notation. Um, and so why should we be limited by visible notation when the copyright Act says we shouldn't, right? That it should, it, it should uh, extend to uh, musical works captured in sound recordings. Um, so uh, second reason why not, right? So uh, historically some elements could be the subject of more deliberation and revision than others, right? So maybe we should value the result of deliberation more than the result of real-time performance. That was definitely part of the strategy of composers um, to be uh, assimilated to um, writers and treated with their greater status and protection in copyright law, rather than kind of the lesser status of entertainers, i.e. musicians. Um, however, right now, uh, sound recording technologies allow deliberation about and revision of all elements of music um, including the idea of comp composition after performance, that is to say that they may uh, incorporate live performances, um, but uh, those live performances can then be manipulated and uh, changed in various ways as they're incorporated into a, uh, a final musical work. Um, and so to the extent that we uh, are sort of biased in favor of those activities which are um, deliberate, um, and not instead of the real-time renditions of performers, I think now we have deliberation and revision um, all the way through. Um, thirdly, uh, will protecting all elements of music make infringement analysis too complex and unpredictable? So I think that depends on, on the interaction on the one hand of what are copyrightable elements, on the other hand, what are infringement standards? Um, and if the standard of substantial similarity is applied seriously at the level of the whole work, um, and if we make clear that, um, uh, you know, as Peter was saying, that, um, uh, you know, single chord progressions, uh, single timbre, single whatever, are not protectable as fragments in themselves, right? Something that plaintiffs love to do, right? They love to take a whole work and then make sure you're focusing on a tiny fragment of that work and then say, ah, this fragment is, is substantially similar to that fragment. If, if we take care with those, and I think, um, you know, any infringement is gonna, re is gonna require uh, recognizable similarities in a collection and arrangement of many elements of, uh, of music, right? And then I don't think it's quite as, as, as complex and impossible. Uh, it's true that if infringement occurs whenever small fragments are copied, then it gets more difficult when you have fragments of different kinds of elements, but that shouldn't be the infringement standard. Um, so looking at this kind of from the opposite uh, perspective, 
if we only protected melody, does that make infringement analysis similar and more predictable? I think that's kind of the, the, the main thesis of, um, of Joseph's, uh, Joe's uh, uh, 2018 article, uh, which is a wonderful article. Uh, I recommend you all read it. Um, but I'm not sure that's the case, right? So, you know, first there's the definitional uh, issue of, of what's a melody. Um, and I, I have I, I made some MIDI files so we could actually have some audio here. Let's hope they all let's hope they work, all right? So let's see if this is a melody we all recognize. Okay, I assume you all recognize that melody. Um, what makes that a melody? And so I have to say, not just that it's a pitch sequence, right? But that. Um, uh, uh, it's a pitch sequence uh, that is in a um, at a tempo and in a range uh, involves pitch durations uh, that are uh, connected to the human voice and to singing. Um, you know that's that is histor historically and I think probably uh, sort of neuropsychologically the case. Um, and uh, so you know pitch sequences that, that show up uh, in other contexts, um, I think we'd have to sort of think twice about is that a, is that a melody or not, just because it's a pitch sequence. So here's, here's a second MIDI file uh, that I can start. Okay, so um, the bass line, in fact, was, um, was, um, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, all over again, right? The same pitch sequence, but of course it had uh, another um, uh, another pitch sequence on top, uh, which which is a well-known Easter hymn, which is why I even sort of had it in mind around this time of year. Um, and um, uh, you know, so did did we did we infringe the melody? Uh, you know, could Mozart have brought a copyright infringement action um, against me because I, I used the same pitch sequence as a bass line with another melody on top. I, not clear to me immediately um, that, that that's the case. And, you know, as we slow it down or speed it up, I think it gets even, um, it gets even more complicated. So here's another MIDI file. <laughs> So that actually had um, that actually had um, a twinkle twinkle little star in there twice. One was as the bass line slowed down even more. The second one was very sped up at the very end, which sounded like a little ornament at the, at the very end, right? Um, and so again, the, well, they have the same pitch sequence, um, but once we take them out of the range of the singable pitch sequence, I think uh, there's a definitional question about melody, right? Um, and then we get into Infringement analysis: What counts as substantially similar? Now, so even if we're if if we were limiting protection to melodies, right? The question would be: Well, if we varied not a melody, if we varied the melody by one note, um, would that would that bring us out of infringement territory? Um, and if that's true, then we've got really narrow uh, copyright protection. Maybe some people would be okay with that, um, but especially with longer melodies and, and long works, you know, very one note, we'd say, oh, no, 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 we have to, we have to expand protection more than that. Um, but then once we start spending, expanding protection more than that, I think one of the things we start seeing is that um, melodies uh, are not separate from uh, harmony or from rhythm. I think they, they contain implicitly uh, both uh, mm -hmm. harmonic and rhythmic elements. Certainly Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? It starts on um, the root, right? It's a tonal piece and it starts on one and it, and it, and it goes up and then back down um, to one. And implicitly, I think we're all hearing that. Um, and so 
you know, let, let's let's take a look at another melody. Okay, so I don't know. What do you think? Did, did that is would that melody infringe "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star"? There's actually quite a few notes that are different, but that melody preserves the harmonic um, sort of the implicit harmonic content of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and, and it completely preserves the rhythm. That's, you know, that's exactly the, uh, the rhythmic content. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if some people said, oh, that, that was, on, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was, um, uh, was under copyright, then that's... They can't hear the oh, they can't, online. They can't hear the, oh, hmm. Should be sharing the audio. Uh, yes. I should do that. Sorry about that. Um, so when I say let's stop share, and when I say share screen, I should be able to choose share, share sound. sound. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So sorry that you haven't heard those. Um, I am uh, not sure we can go back at this point. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'll go back one, right? And this is the this is the clip one side. So what I suggest with that is there's a lot of notes in there that are different from uh, from Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? But it, it preserves the the harmonic sort of arc and and the rhythm, um, which is why we might recognize like oh that that sounds a little bit like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? So here's a version that is closer in terms of, you know, how many half steps or steps did you go up or down, but it's going to be harmonically quite different. Um, and so I think, well, we'll just listen to it and we'll, we'll see what you think uh, about, and as soon as I try to do that, it goes over to the next clip of those. Okay, I mean, infringing, um, it, it's, it's harmonically quite different, rhythmically the same, right? So um, let's think about uh, a, adding a different rhythm. Okay, well, so um, you get what I, I mean, what I'm trying to suggest is that even when we stick with sort of melody, melody implicitly contains harmonic and rhythmic components, um, and um, I'll, I'll play one last clip, you know, to suggest that if we if we preserve the melody, but we put it in a harmonic context um, that's quite different, um, then mm -hmm. we're we're changing some things. And I, at some point, I think you know maybe we don't have uh, we don't have infringement anymore. So here. So should we say in that case, well, that was the same melody, doesn't matter that the, the sort of harmonic context is different, or should we say, no, wait, wait. the melody we were thinking of the beginning, it started at the root and, it's, and it goes back down, and this is, this is different. Um, I don't know. Something for discussion afterwards. Ah! That's not what I meant to do. I meant to go to the next slide. Uh, oh, boy, everything's <laughs> So next, um, you know, will protecting all the notes of music make copyright protection too broad? So some people's worry is just that, um, it, you know, we should protect only some elements because otherwise we're opening it up to too much uh, infringement. Um, and I, I think the answer is, um, uh, you know, Jamie Lund's experiments show that, that opening up could actually narrow copyright protection. Uh, and in any case, the the, the question of how broad or narrow protection is going to be depends both on which elements you're going to protect and upon the infringement standards that you're going to adopt. Um, and we can adjust both of them. Um, but I'm kind of suggesting reasons why I think we should adjust infringement standards rather than um, edit out some 
uh, some elements. Um, six, should we protect music only as notated for normative reasons, right? Because this is going to incentivize a, a kind of complexity that is aesthetically preferable, right? That, that we think is better. Um, and so I, I want to give a tribute to the invention of, um, you know, standard uh, musical uh, notation, staff notation, because there's no question that it enables certain kinds of, of melodic and harmonic and structural complexity. And I personally, I love that kind of complexity. If you looked at my Spotify um, playlist, like the, the year in review, um, you would see that all five of Beethoven's piano concertos are like in the top 20 and um, a bunch of symphonies from Beethoven and Brahms and Mahler and Dvorak, et cetera. Um, and so when you think of like the sonata form, right, which starts with an exposition of a theme and you can break it down further into a first subject group, a transition, a second subject group, a codetta, and then you have development and then you have recapitulation. I love that stuff. Um, I don't think it could have developed without uh, written musical notation. Um, all that having been said, you know, I think that embedding that aesthetic value choice in music copyright law uh, would be a radically new direction that um, you don't find in other areas of copyright, I don't think. Um, and so we'd have to think about why, why do we put that here? Why do we put that here? Um, in addition, right, sound recording and the technologies of music synthesis and manipulation uh, are relatively new technologies. They have enabled much greater experimentation and complexity in other elements of music. Um, I think that they have, they have sort of spilled over even to non-sound recording situations. I don't know if any of you know the, the uh, vocal group Broom Full of Teeth. It's a wonderful vocal group based in New York. They're, they're, they're classic, they do classical, uh, modern classical stuff. Um, and they do a lot of experiments uh, with composers in different ways of using their voices, I think that probably has something to do with having, ha being able to have the repeatable experience of sound as recorded, which it perfectly, right, which we didn't have previously with sound recording. I think it's great. Um, and then I ask, but it, isn't it kind of nostalgic or regressive to protect only the kinds of complexity that were supported by older technologies and not um, current technologies. Uh, having some musical practices focus more narrowly on certain elements such as me melody, absolutely, right? Both some kind of elite and some popular musical practices have. Um, before broadcasting, before sound recordings, you were at home, you had a piano around 1900, let's say, um, and you sang, right? Absolutely, that focuses on, uh, that focuses on melody. For those practices and for the works that were composed with those practices in mind, melody is important, but that doesn't extend to all the music, right? There's lots of other kinds of music that in which melody isn't so central. Um, oh, this is actually an earlier version of my slideshow, so I, I, I slide deck. I had one more slide um, which sort of asked a kind of technical statu statutory question about uh, 114B of the Section 114E of the Copyright Act, which, as many of you know, says that sound recording gets less protection and in particular um, independently fixed uh, imitations of uh, sounds that are on another sound recording uh, are permitted. They are not, the copyright in the sound uh, recording does not protect against those imitations, right? And so the, the question might be, doesn't that section, 114B, uh, imply that we need a distinction between composition and performance in music because the performance elements are those elements that can be imitated if they're independently uh, fixed, whereas the composition elements can't be, right? And, and the fact that we have section 114B in there sort of by implication necessarily means that there has to be this distinction. Um, I don't think that's the case. Uh, for one, there are lots of sound recordings that are not music at all. Um, and section 114B certainly has, still has meaning with respect to those. Um, and secondly, I, I think that the, 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 the legislative history of 114B 
um, is complicated and, and dubious. I wrote another article which argues that uh, it stems from this, uh, this very doubtful 1950 case uh, involving um, a, a white cover recording of a, of a African American uh, musical group in which the, the, uh, the judge uh, sort of basically doesn't want to give the, uh, the original African American musical group any rights and so narrowly construes uh, what's protected. But um, uh, I, the, the bottom line is I don't think 114D sort of necessitates that. Okay, so that's all I have to say. I will stop my share, um, and uh, I think uh, that the next up is Charles, right? <coughs> so, uh, Charles, I'm going to just uh, share your slides, I guess. So I'll prepare this for you, and um, we're going to make sure that when we share these, we will share the sound, because I know you have some sound here as well. Okay. Values um, coordinator here <laughs> to which I move these forward. So, here and then, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted, uh, before I get started, um, to, to thank Peter Danielson and James Ray Tremay um, who uh, sponsored our program, and also Bob, of course, for. Accommodating, indulging me in, in um, a, di a discussion of a, of a an issue that's um, near and, and dear to my my heart. Um, so, the question um, that we've uh, um, set forth for ourselves in this discussion is the meets and bounds of protectable expression. Um, and, and a little, just to elaborate on that a bit, I think the question is what original expression should copyright protect and should that change over time? Um, we know that uh, musical works, especially popular musical, musical works, uh, change, have changed in the, the means of their production, in the means of their consumption, if you will, that is by both performers and, uh, and listeners over time. Um, and should, this, should these changes uh, affect the scope of copyrightable expression? And my answer, um, as popular as it may be, is that uh, changes in content, means of production, production et cetera, uh, have no bearing, uh, or should have no bearing on the scope of copyrightable expression uh, for works in any genre, including music. And um, as, a, as a corollary of that, um, only visible scores and machine-generated audio renderings, typically through a, a MIDI uh, of renditions, um, of these works uh, should we define a protectable uh, expression in infringement disputes. Um, <clears throat> the mischief, I think, that uh, um, has uh, gave rise to the, the issue, that this, this, this very question, is the 1976 Act that allowed uh, sound recordings to be uh, used as uh, representing uh, the, the scope of a, of a work for, uh, uh, for registration and, uh, and protection. Um, and uh, in the 76 Act, as, as you're aware, the, the, um, the musical work uh, can be uh, represented in an audible uh, a format um, but it, um, and uh, as well as in a, uh, a visible format. However, the audible format can also be used as the, the basis for a uh, sound recording uh, copyright. So I simply wanted to make a few observations um, on this issue to, uh, to support uh, the reason for my uh, belief that uh, we should continue to rely on visual uh, uh, documentation of musical works in determining the scope of protectable expression. Um, so here we have two scores. Um, the one on the left um, is by Wagner. Um, and in fact, the uh, 
it's just down the street at the Library of Congress. And it was the first thing that came up when I when I when I when I was scouting about the net to get a, a, a manuscript by Wagner. Um, and uh, I, any any idea any guesses as to which of his operas this is? There's a hint. Oh, I think there's a hint in the in the in the verbal text. Look, there's I think at one. I think there's a small for us. Is it too small? And I I can't do that. Anyway, I think it says um, uh, Wasser as uh, Wasser as Blut. Okay, does that get 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 bring us anywhere? <laughs> I suspect it's a, a page from Parsifal. Um, there's, in any case, um, so here's a here's a, 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 a score of Wagner on the left, and a what uh, a score quote unquote. Um, I don't know if you can read the the right hand uh, autograph manuscript, um, but it's a song uh, by uh, Madonna. I don't know what the song is. I, I guess it's probably the first line of the song. Anyway, to my knowledge, this is the only visible representation of Madonna's uh, score for this. For this, is this to give a sense either with lyrics or, or is there actually some kind of verbal instruction that? Could be used? No, it's just it's it's words. It's okay. purely purely yeah. purely verbal. Yeah. Text. yeah. Um, okay. So. There's a, um, I, I, I have a quotation here from an article by Rame Arreo, um, who we should have invited, in fact, to not, not defend herself, but to, um, uh, to elaborate on, on what she said here. Um, she, but she wrote an article um, with the title, A Musical Work is a Set of Instructions, which in many ways, you know, I thought about that for some time, and it's, uh, it's, um, it's very appealing and very attractive and very neat in many, in many respects, and yet I think it privileges the performer um, a, a bit the way a, uh, a recipe uh, privileges the cook that uh, that uh, that renders it. Um, obviously, the a recipe is only as as, as effective as the um, as, as 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 it's rendered by a particular individual, and um, that's the impression that I or the implication that I think lies in in Fermi's remark. Um, so I, what is a score? And I think I, I very, very um, fundamental uh, way, I think um, I would describe it as a visible symbolic documentation of a sequence of pitches, notes, um, on diachronic and uh, synchronic, synchronic dimensions, so uh, both vertical and, and horizontal uh, dimensions. Um, and I think it's important in uh, um, recognizing the, import the, the uh, value of a score and the visual representation of a score is that some music, very, very little, is, was actually is intended to be, uh, was, was, was created as a, an, a non, a work independent of sound, right? The one most famous is uh, Bach's Art of the Fugue, which for many years musicologists refer to as Augenmusik, or eye music. It's not something that plays, and in fact, it wasn't for any specific instrument. It was just written as a, as a, as an <coughs> exposition of his extraordinary Bach's extraordinary brilliance in, in uh, drafting um, um, every imaginable variation and uh, a fugal variation. Um, there's a nice um, uh, clip from Amadeus that I wanted to share, share with you. Um, and Claudia, if you could <laughs> fire that up, that would. Uh, That's the next slide. Just go to the next yeah. slide. Oh, next slide, of course. Yes. Boom. Okay. Um, I don't know if. Um, the cursor on the right. 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 So this, um, there was this. Uh, you remember? You may remember this movie from now, probably 25, 30 years ago. Um, um, and uh, Salieri, the, uh, the, the protagonist here, um, is looking at scores, um, uh, autograph scores by Mozart, um, an autograph score by Mozart, 
there's no there were there were no ways of, no instruments play to hear sound, but he's simply reading the score, um, and but it so uh, effectively uh, captures um, in my mind is how the visual score to an educated musician how a visual score can be so uh, such a powerful um, uh, document and can so um, and can enliven and uh, can come to light simply in one's mind. He, he, he's hearing these works in in his in his uh, mind's ear, if you will. Um, uh, there's there's no external source that's uh, that's, uh, um, that's that's playing here. On the page, it looked nothing. The beginning simple, almost comic. Just a pulse, bassoons, basset horns, like a rusty squeeze box. <laughs> and then, suddenly, high above it, an oboe. A single note hanging there, unwavering. Until a clarinet took it over. And sweetened it into a phrase of such delight. This was no composition by a performing monkey. This was a music I'd never heard. Filled with such longing, such unfulfillable longing. It seemed to me that I was hearing the voice of God. Excuse me. Okay, um, it reminds me of, I don't know if any of you as musicians have ever gone to a bricks and mortar music score shop. They don't exist anymore. I think there's, there's one that I know of at Juilliard School, which is quite still, still quite a, 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 um, elaborate. But I used to, when I would go to a music store, you'd see educated musicians, instrumentalists, pick up scores and, and simply read them. And you could, you could see the fascination that, oh, I haven't seen this before. And maybe conduct a little bit, maybe hum a little bit. But they're reading a score, um, and uh, they didn't. You don't need the uh, need the um, an actual auditory experience in order to appreciate the work. Um, okay, next point I want to make is that there is a continuum of significance of mediating non-authors in displaying, distributing, performing contextual expression, um, and this ties in a little bit, I think, uh, Bob, with what you were discussing. Um, so. All works have some uh, mediating non-authors uh, to be, uh, uh, to be for, con for consumers, for readers, for, um, for listeners, etc. Um, a, 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 a painting in a museum depends to some extent on the, the, whoever arranged the lighting, whoever framed the work, etc. Not a whole lot. The picture can pretty much stand on its own, but there, there's, there's got to be somebody or some mediating force to make it um, accessible and perceptible to the public. The same with literary works. Um, you know, it depends. If you read a you know, a, um, a novel and it's and it's um, on the on the, um, and the, the the pages are underlined or have coffee stains on them or blotches or whatever, it's a it's a less appealing experience than if you're reading a book. Uh, with with a nice paper that that doesn't have missing pages that that uh, holds together well, etc. Um, and so the the publisher, um, the the um, who decides on the font and the type and the the, the, the paper and the binding, etc., has something to do with the experience of uh, the the ultimate uh, uh, consumer of that work. Um, and then this continuum shifts a bit more toward the performer when you get to dramatic works. And, um, and this, this you know, depends on the work. Some works, um, you know, work of Shakespeare, um, in some ways can even be less appealing 
outside its uh, its, uh, its 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 text, its its, its stable text, and uh, the interpreters can in fact um, diminish the, the value of the work. But by and large, the uh, the performers, dramatic and the dramatic works, the actors um, uh, play a play a significant role in conveying that work, making it perceptible to the public. And that's true, of course, with musical works as well. Um, and in some genres to a greater extent than, than in others. Certainly in jazz and improvisation, uh, improvisational genres, the author in many ways is the mediator. Um, and, uh, uh, and so they're, 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 they're almost inextricable. In choreographic works, uh, works, of, works of dance, the, the value is very much skewed, I think, toward the mediator. And in fact, that may be why uh, choreographic notation is so primitive, even, even now. If you look at a, a dance notation score, it's not like looking at a music score. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really read dance notation, but I, I've never seen anybody look at a dance notation score the way Salieri did at Mozart's score and say, oh, you know, be blown away by the, by the beauty of the, of the, the choreography. Um, it depends a lot on uh, the mediator. Okay. Um, and now um, I want to talk about what I, I consider a hierarchy of compositional elements in determining musical expression. And this, um, I think, ties in, Bob, with um, uh, some of the points you made as well. Um, so let's, uh, let's first talk uh, about... Um, Joseph Fishman and his comment in the, the highly touted and um, highly regarded uh, article he wrote in the Harvard Law Review in 2018. Um, and I pulled this out of context, I'm sure, but I just it stuck with me as I, as I glanced through it recently, um, where he says, as a fact of matter, the no notion that melody is the primary, my screen's a little bit, um, uh, okay is the primary locus of music's value as a fiction. Um, and I've been thinking about that for some time, and I, I would say, to respond to that by saying, but typically, all compositional elements in the musical work ultimately depend, to a greater or lesser extent, on melody. Um, and so then you, then you, you, I break down the compositional, or, or elements, musical elements, into what I consider primarily compositional elements. Or melody, harmony, and rhythm, um, and then compositional, uh, and then elements that kind of fall along a continuum um, between composition and performance. Um, so that means key. You can play "Happy Birthday" in any key, and it's still "Happy Birthday." Um, even mode, major and minor mode, to some extent, although that's a fairly significant um, um, attribute, musical attribute. Um, instrumentation, timbre, phrasing, dynamics articulation, tempo, volume, etc. Um, you speak to a string player and they will, they will you know, talk about bowing in a very um, sacred terms. You know, it makes a huge difference whether you're playing it up or down bow. Um, nevertheless, that in my, in my view is a, um, is, a, is a secondary or, a, 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 or a, an element more performing, a more, more connected with performance uh, than with composition. Um, and I think this dependence um, supports my view of the primacy of melody, of the significance of melody, that without it, there's really very little. Um, and as Bob said, melody typically implies, if, doesn't, if not contains, um, uh, both harmony and, and rhythm. Um, and my view is that uh, melody is, uh, is a series of pitches in a particular rhythmic uh, 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 pattern. Um, and sometimes, in fact, melody it outlines harmonies that you can, uh, you can uh, as, uh, hear and, and, uh, and articulate as, a, as independent of the, the melody. Um, and I would say that, and this is, uh, I think it's kind of axiomatic, axiomatic that the more an the economic value of a work depends upon a specific performer, the less protectable musical expression it contains. And conversely, the more independent the economic, and I'm assuming that uh, Joseph meant by value, not 
necessarily or exclusively aesthetic value, but probably in terms of copyright, economic or uh, uh, commercial uh, value. The more independent the economic value of a work of a specific performer, the greater the protectable musical expression. Um, so in the, the Bach art of the fugue, it's extremely high protectable musical expression if they were copyrighted at the time, um, because it's completely independent of a specific performer. It doesn't at all, um, its value isn't in any way tied to uh, a performance element or an individual. Okay. Um, the advantages and significance of visual representations of musical works. So here we have a picture of a, the image of a, a brooch from the 9th century AD, um, a brooch made for uh, King Alfred of England. It's at the British Museum. Um, and uh, I, I came across this in a Wall Street Journal article that a month ago. Um, it was a book review, in fact, but um, it caught my eye, my eye, as, as you know, not my ear, my eye, um, because it, uh, it it talks about the, or, or it, it, this, this brooch uh, represents the hierarchy of senses. So you have here in the center, oh, and the, so in the, in the middle of the brooch, you have a, a ring with four figures on the, on the uh, surrounding the central figure. The one in the bottom left is holding his hand to his ear, so that's um, hearing. The one above that is putting something into his mouth, that's taste. The one on the right, he's, he, I assume it's a he, is sniffing what looks like a, 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 a big leaf, and that's, so that's, that's scent. It looks like a, 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 sort of a shovel or something, but he's, he's actually, that's a, that's a plant. And then down below, so the, uh, below him, uh, the, the individual is clapping their hands, so that's, that's touch. But in the center is the primary character, and with his big eyes, and the primary character, of course, is sight. And sight, as they knew then, and as we, we know now, is the most developed, the most acute of the human senses. Um, and it offers distance um, needed to create and perceive complex works in every medium of, ex of expression. Um, if you think of classical Greece, remember um, back in my day, um, when uh, music history courses, every, every course in the country I took, every introductory, introductory music history course used what was called uh, the Grout, um, Grout, which was a, a textbook, a big textbook of the history of Western music. Um, and I remember the first few chapter, the first chapter or so of Grout, um, he was a Cornell mus musicologist from many, many years ago. The first uh, 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 chapter of Grout talked about Greek music. And it was a very short chapter. It basically said, well, we've got these images, we've got these lyres or whatever, but we really have no idea what Greek music sounded like. Why? Because we have no documentation, no no visible scores. And the same would have been true with Greek, uh, with classical Greek literature. Thank goodness for whom? For Homer, who actually wrote it down. Probably wasn't all his, but he, he gathered um, oral, uh, oral tales and poetry, um, and orally transmitted tales and poetry, and, um, and uh, recorded them visually. Um, and that's why we know we, we have uh, uh, this extraordinary literary tradition going all the way back to the Greeks because of visual documentation of it. Okay, and now um, to home in on, on Bob's uh, approach, uh, which is, and, uh, and I'm very glad uh, Bob and Joseph are here to, to uh, uh, contextualize these um, far more uh, appropriately than I. Um, so, so Bob claims that an approach that recognizes that phono record and embodied musical works are distinct from notated musical works and are protectable on their own terms can potentially better serve the purposes of copyright law. And I think that the or is in there in there, so, um, is the ter determinations about the presence and amount of copyrightable expression in musical works should be independent of the media in which they are placed. Um, 
And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a, a quick benediction that, that um, uh, alludes to this, which I'll simply read. Uh, lacking the perspective that visual notation provides authors and readers, and by extension performers, of musical works, phonorecord embodied musical works tend to have minimal original music expression and necessarily formulaic and derivative melodies, harmonies, and rhythms. Their appeal, at least their economic value by and large, will accordingly depend primarily on non or secondary musical elements, like a specific performer. Typically today, in popular music, the putative primary author um, of the work and those ministrations and the ministrations of audio engineers and who doctor live performances and recordings into a work, into works whose value, that is it, economic value, is generated mainly by their sound. The US copyright statute has it right. Sound recordings contain and render musical works, but their protectable expression is independent from those musical works. It's courts and juries that don't get it when they conflate primarily sonic slash performance elements with purely musical elements in adjudicating claims involving infringement of musical underscore work. While the content of musical works evolves over time, the elements comprising them never change, nor does the hierarchy of dependence among them. Only of courts, the determinations of protectable musical expression and claims of infringement recognize this hierarchy and we avoid straightjacking musicians by allowing the monopolization of sounds and secondary musical elements, that is, ideas expressly outside the scope of copyright protection. And with that, I will uh, turn things over to Joseph. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. This is great. I don't get to talk about this in as much detail as often as I would like to. Um, so uh, Peter left us off at the end of his remarks by saying we should be talking about melody. Um, I am delighted that we're all talking about melody. Some of us are more in favor of uh, limiting Copy, music copyright infringement to melody than others, but we're all talking about it. I want to talk about melody too. Um, so Ed Sheeran is uh, most likely heading to trial um, very soon, the latest in a long line, uh, a line that's getting longer, of high profile copyright infringement suits where the question is always how similar is too similar um, and over the last eight years or so, there had been a narrative building up that all of these cases are making songwriters uh, afraid that it's too easy to get sued for um, a similar song. Um, and a big part of that narrative was that songwriters were all of a sudden getting in trouble for imitating certain elements of existing songs that previously they had always been free to imitate if they wanted to. And that there was a shift that was destabilizing people's sense of what was okay to copy um, and what wasn't. Um, we may now be seeing the pendulum swinging back in the other direction. Uh, some courts have been reasserting themselves as gatekeepers who can dismiss a case uh, without needing to send it uh, on to a jury. I think a big part of that uh, is uh, Peter's Led Zeppelin case in the Ninth Circuit. Um, also the Katy Perry decision, Gray versus Hudson, that followed closely on his heels. Um, both the substance of those decisions, but I think also importantly the optics of those decisions, signal that maybe it's not so easy to win an infringement claim against songwriters after all. Um, and uh, as one of Katy Perry's lawyers told the New York Times uh, after that decision, and I'm quoting, the blurred lines curse, its chilling effect has been lifted, end quote. Um, so in the grand scheme of copyright things, um, 
all of these developments are pretty recent, and I wanted to use my time here uh, to present a longer view of how copyright has historically defined what kinds of music copying count as infringement, what's changed in recent years, um, and the relative merits of those two different approaches, um, and why, um, in spite of uh, all of the uh, good arguments that uh, Bob raised earlier, uh, I continue to think that uh, restricting music infringement claims uh, to melodic copying is the better way to go. Uh, so when the Blurred Lines infringement claim made it past summary judgment, won at trial, and was eventually affirmed on appeal, the winning theory of substantial similarity was based on uh, a so-called constellation of multiple different overlapping elements that ran through the course of the entire song. It was a whole work uh, claim. Um, and a lot of observers, entertainment lawyers, musicologists, songwriters, journalists, uh, expressed shock that an infringement claim could succeed based on musical elements other than melody and lyrics. Um, and the truth is that the Blurred Lines case was not the first one to allow a theory of non-melodic infringement to go forward. There were earlier cases that did it too. Um, but until the last 20 years or so, um, that shock would have been very well placed. Melody had historically been the primary focus of music infringement claims at the expense of all those other elements that we saw um, in slides earlier, like harmony and orchestration and timbre. Um, you could go back to the mid 19th century in the United States when uh, music infringement claims first got started. Um, going back even earlier uh, in England where those US cases were drawing from. Um, and the legal authorities that entrenched this melody first approach are mostly judicial, uh, judicial decisions um, as I'll discuss, but I do want to mention that it's also reflected today in the statutory mechanical license, section 115 of the US Copyright Act, which allows cover versions to adapt a song stylistically just so long as it doesn't uh, change, in the words of the statute, the basic melody or fundamental character of the work. Melody is the only thing that gets singled out in the statute. Um, I think it was even clearer under the preceding Copyright Act, the 1909 Act, which defined the reproduction right for musical works um, as to make any arrangement or setting of it, meaning the work, or of the melody of it. Uh, so again, melody was the only compositional element that uh, was singled out in the statute. Um, that made music copyright different than other copyrightable subject matter. Um, for visual art, uh, for film, for dramatic works, um, and I think Bob ran through um, a number uh, of these examples, infringement could turn on any one of several different characteristics or combinations of characteristics. Um, so for music, why was it so singularly focused on melody even during the course of the 20th century when other areas of copyrightable subject matter were becoming more holistic? I think one big reason is a persistent cultural norm that melody is the aesthetic part of the work. Um, we can talk about the economic heart of the work in, in some genres, but at least um, the aesthetic heart of the work going back to uh, early 19th century European art museums. Uh, there was a British case called the Almain du Bouzy um, uh, from 1835. Uh, and it involved a music publisher who had arranged a bunch of serious, very high-minded arias from Albert's opera Le Stoke, and he, tur he turned them into light dance music, but uh, without authorization. Um, and the publisher argued that this was a fair abridgment, so a predecessor doctrine to what we would now call fair use, um, and uh, was a relatively permissive regime for non-literal copying by second comers, and the court uh, rejected it, and it said, uh, Melody is that in which the whole meritorious part of the invention consists. Um, the invention here is, is the work of music. The original aria requires the aid of genius for its construction. 
but a mere mechanic in music can make the adaptation of accompaniment. That attitude reflected aesthetic views in 19th century Europe. That's how many composers talked um, about uh, uh, music and melody. That's how many philosophers of music talked about music and melody. Um, and it became how uh, important legal decision makers talked about music and melody too. It then gets imported into US copyright law in an 1850 case called Jolly v. Jock, um, which relies extensively on um, that British case, Del Mandy Boozy. Um, and that premise um, that only the melody matters um, keeps kicking around through nearly the entire 20th century. There are a number of learned hand decisions from the 1910s and 1920s that employ that principle. Um, and its clearest articulation came, um, and I'm moving chronologically very quickly right now, but uh, in a 1952 case from the Southern District of New York called Northern Music versus King Records. Um, and uh, uh, you'll have to indulge me here because this is, this is um, a longer quote, but the court said, neither rhythm nor harmony can in itself be the subject of copyright. It is in the melody of the composition or the arrangement of notes or tones that originality must be found. It is the arrangement or succession of musical notes which are the fingerprints of the composition and establish its identity. Okay? It, so in other words, the whole ontology of a musical work is rooted in its melody. Now, personally, I am skeptical if that has ever been true for all musical works that were being produced at any, any given point in history. But it, I think it is certainly not true of a lot of music that has been produced over the last century and a lot of music that's being produced today. I do not think it is true of a lot of jazz. I do not think it is true of a lot of hip hop music. I do not think it is true of a lot of electronic dance music. Um, I don't think it's even true of a lot of 20th century art music. I don't think that fairly characterizes um, the uh, the main value of a lot of Debussy's work or of Messiaen's work. Um, uh, I think uh, there are some Stravinsky works that really have a lot more to do with rhythm than with, than with melody, um, and, and in particular non-pitched rhythm. Um, so to say that that applies across the board I think is just um, far too overbroad. Um, uh, and I haven't even gotten into uh, the economic value of non-melodic elements um, where you know, often uh, the, the, the production of the underlying track uh, is what is, uh, 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 labels are willing to pay a lot more for um, than a top line melody in some cases because that is perceived to be the commercial value um, of the recording is the underlying track. Um, so I think the traditional justification for privileging melody is weak. Um, there should be no surprise when a case like Blurred Lines comes along um, and the court thinks uh, that uh, it, uh, it doesn't need to dismiss a claim. It can let a claim reach a jury even in the absence of a legitimate allegation of melodic copying. Um, and today courts are not limiting the analysis to melodic um, infringement the way that they used to. Um, so why am I still saying uh, if, if the justification was weak, the courts had always relied on, why do I still like it? Well, there's a trade-off here. Um, on the one hand, I think uh, the law today is working with a much richer definition of what a musical work is instead of what is an artificially narrow conception that it's always really about the tune. Um, and so far as it goes, I think that's a good thing. But there's another side to that trade-off. On the other hand, it becomes a lot harder to predict what's infringing and what's not if you need to keep track of multiple possible points of similarity instead of just one. So I'd say that US copyright law has ended up with a more accurate conception of musical creativity but a lot less predictability in the system. My own view is that we were better off 
under that earlier melody-focused regime, not because uh, melody is always the heart of every musical work, but just because keeping it, putting it at the heart as a matter of copyright law made the system more um, administrable and certain. I think relative to other kinds of copyrightable creativity, like visual arts, like um, dramatic works, uh, music is more modular, and it is, and again, I'm making a relative rather than an absolute point here, I think it is relatively easier for composers to break off a discrete chunk called melody um, and focus on that as the thing to avoid copying. And if you're trying to figure out how close you can get to an existing work, you then don't have to play uh, this, I think, impossible game of trying to figure out some kind of overall index of similarity which requires assigning unknowable weights to similarity between melodies, between harmonies, between, between instrumentations. Um, you just need to know, don't copy the melody. Um, and I think that it, it, it reduces uh, uh, error costs, uh, it reduces chilling effects. I think ultimately it helps downstream creativity because people know what the rules are. Now, to uh, Bob's point from earlier, this is by no means a bright line. Um, there is plenty of, of muddiness, even in a world in which we were limiting our inquiry to melody. But it at least cabins the inquiry, right? Imagine needing to keep track of all of those difficult questions um, that, uh, uh, for those of you who could hear the, um, the, the audio, right, that, that, that those examples nicely raised, but then also need to keep track of everything else that was teed up by a case like Blurred Lines, um, where we were talking about seven, eight, nine other elements running through the length of the work. So I think um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a bright line, but it is a narrower, uh, or it's a, it's a smaller pit of mud that we all need to roll around in, rather than a giant pit of mud. Um, and I wish that I could say, I, I appreciate the references to, um, uh, to the, the article that I wrote about uh, some of this. Um, I wish that I could say that I was the first one who came up with all of this. Um, I, I was preempted by about a century um, by uh, an, a composer um, and an expert witness named Frederick Bridge. British composer um, who served as an expert witness in a, at least in the US, a very obscure copyright case uh, from 1922 um, called Austin versus Columbia Gramophone. And in that case, uh, the defendant had copied a new arrangement of an 18th century opera. So the melodies were old, they were in the public domain, but all the orchestral settings that had been copied were new. Um, and the question was, well, it's just copying the, the new settings of old melodies, does that constitute infringement? And Bridge showed up in court to testify as an expert on behalf of the accused infringer that the best rule that the court could fashion would be to restrict music infringement claims to melodies alone. And it had nothing to do with the qualitative importance of melody economic, aesthetic, or otherwise. It was purely an issue of predictability. And here's what he told the court. He said, the principle that there is only copyright in a sequence of notes is a rough and ready rule which may not be perfect in its application to all cases, but it is intelligible and clear. Any other principle will certainly be very difficult for the musician to apply and almost impossible for a lawyer himself probably an expert to interpret, end quote. I think that's exactly right. Uh, the problem is that argument lost miserably. Uh, the plaintiff's contributions were held to be sufficiently creative to deserve protection. Right? Predictability wasn't the organizing principle, it was creativity. Um, and I think it would almost certainly lose if you tried to make that argument for the same reason uh, in court today. Judges do not prioritize predictability in substantial similarity doctrine um, 
courts often just throw up their hands and they say, well, that's never going to happen. Um, and, you know, to that I say, well, it has happened. Right? Music copyright over the course of the 20th century and back into the 19th shows a glimpse at what we haven't seen elsewhere, an infringement inquiry that was really tethered to a single component of the work. Um, so I think it is possible. Um, at least in music, it's possible. Uh, and I think the historical test that focused primarily on melody was right. It was just for the wrong reasons. Um, music infringement should focus on melody not because melody is necessarily more valuable, but because that focus makes it easier for everyone to know which kinds of copying are permissible and which aren't. Right? Not with perfect clarity, but at least with enough, with enough uh, incremental uh, clarity on top of what we are stuck with um, right now in a world where a blurred lines type claim can go forward, um, I would rather be uh, in the world, the copyright world that existed before. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Two, two, uh, two images here, which is one less. Uh, so, uh, discussion, I guess uh, here you've been uh, patiently waiting uh, for a long time. So, the first panelist, do you have uh, uh, reactions, comments, or questions to uh, three of us and our anything else? Well, it was very, very interesting. And but I have to say, with all respect, I have to go with the idea of notation and melody. And, and the thing that struck me the most out of all of this, and there were a lot of excellent points and, and very interesting thoughts, really gets back to something that you started with, that, that copyright protects or, or uh, rewards authors. And we know from the case law that that's part of it, but it really is to encourage new works. And if you over reward authors, if you allow them to claim protection, not only in the fact in the melody, but throw in that they used a synth and throw in something else. And all of a sudden, you know, a record company has to pay them off or go to trial. You're discouraging people from creating new works. And, and I think um, the last panel panelist made that point really well. If you're going to err on the side of something, I don't think you err on the side of rewarding authors. I think you err on the side of keeping the public domain and musical building blocks available for everyone. That's how you effectuate the policy, the underlying policy of creation. And you know, and that was the reason why we had one of the, the amica briefs in the on bank in Stairway was I think 123 songwriters who said, look, we should be able to use a descending chromatic scale. You know, we shouldn't be sued for using it this chromatic scale. And that was a big part of the plaintiff's case in there that they, they had a tone color, two acoustic guitars finger picked in a studio recording, plus a descending chromatic scale. I mean, during the course of that case, I would ask everyone, court reporters, you know, friends, you know, do they sound similar? And if they didn't have a music background, they said, yeah, it's a drum guitar, finger picked guitar, it sure sounds the same. Those with the music background said, wait a second, it's a guitar in a descending chromatic scale. So I think if, if you allow it to, to go, you know, maybe there's some room, maybe, you know, a, a selection and arrangement claim that combines melody, you know, a short piece of melody with a, a, a certain uh, chord progression and a specific rhythm, maybe that flies. But going beyond that to all the performance elements that were, were discussed, I think just threatens to rob the public domain. Okay. Um, reaction from panelists. Two panelists who probably agree with that in some way. <laughs> <laughs>
keeping enough material in the stock that other people, that our future composers can, and songwriters can draw from. Um, and I think, I think there, there's a relationship between those, those two goals for me, um, where if I, I think the world of songwriters, that's, you know, I, I, I live in Nashville, I'm surrounded by them. Um, and I, I can imagine them, you know, if you, if you, if you set a bar um, uh, someplace, it will, be, they will always impress you in their ability to jump over it. Um, but they need to know where that bar is set. Uh, and I think if you, to me, the greatest threat to chilling, uh, to the, the greatest threat to continuing cumulative creativity in the production of music um, isn't that we are going to run out of stuff to say. Um, it's that songwriters aren't going to know what they're allowed to say, what they are allowed to copy, and what they aren't allowed to copy. So I really like prioritizing clear lines, or as, as clear as we can realistically get. Um, so I, I think that I just wanted to highlight that uh, the through line between having uh, more certain rules and how that uh, can affect downstream cumulative creativity by the people who need to uh, play within those uh, those rules and restrictions. I, uh, I guess one of my reactions uh, uh, to those both of these comments is to actually rethink about the situation in which um, the kind of Jamie Lund situation, which you can isolate a pitch sequence that is identical or close to identical, but the context actually uh, uh, makes it sound different. Let's like say that that um, whether it's uh, ordinary lay listeners or even um, rather sophisticated musical listeners, um, because the entire sort of harmonic background and the pitch and everything out in the tempo and everything else um, is different, uh, that you, you don't recognize that pitch sequence. And yet, there's a situation in which sort of being able to isolate the melody or isolate the pitch Melody, I think, has very broad and narrow uh, interpretation. Um, you isolate one pitch sequence in that score, you like the, the, the very complicated score of, of Pleasanton, perhaps, uh, and you say, aha, uh -huh. you know, uh, uh, someone else wrote that before, um, and yet it's, you don't even recognize that in the context of the entire, um, in the entire composition. Is that a way in which sort of Focusing on pitch sequences actually may work the opposite way because it, it, it broadens perception and it, in some cases may increase predictability um, because there's, there's, there's the kind of got you, like I found your, the pitch sequence somewhere in your complex composition and I created that pitch sequence and you and, and you are exposed to my work, right? And so it's, it's a Melody should be uh, a necessary condition, but it shouldn't should be sufficient, um, right? Like if you if you copy a, a sequence of pitches, but then contextualize them in such a way that, that listeners don't notice, mm -hmm. um, then uh, that could be non-infringing, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you um, have uh, copied that pitch. Right? But you should there should be at least notes uh, in sequence that are in common between the pitches. I'd go beyond that. And I think in um, jazz, um, and uh, the example that I think is pretty similar. Um, if uh, Wynton Marsalis decided to uh, riff on um, Posey, is that the name of the famous musical Disney movie? Musical, yeah, okay. And he tried to use it. And that riff, or and it might not even be re recognizable. Um, I think it's wrong that he would have to go to Disney, perhaps, but he would, in order to get permission to use that thing. But he had, he had been so transformed um, that it would be a different point. In a way, um, um, 
That's not by Mozart. The, the melody isn't by Mozart, but he, what he 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 made it his. Yeah. By uh, these the series of variations that yeah. he made Mozart. Um, and I think what he did is he so transformed the the melody um, that uh, he, that it's permissible. And it does not in any way, in my in my view, the the question is does it undermine the economic potential. And, and if you look at the earliest U.S. copyright uh, they typically involved work, defending works that were in arguably republications of the earlier work. That I can see as being uh, indefensible. But the farther you get from that, the more the work becomes uh, inspired by or homage to um, the, the more, uh, the, the, the less vulnerable, in my opinion, um, to um, uh, even if you bodily take the melody and you you make it, and it's not immediately perceptible to or not readily perceptible to listeners, and in no way will rob or undermine the market for the original for the, 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 the previous work. Um, I would think that that's uh, that's not. So I do think that uh, the answer to all of this has to be some combination of uh, what's copyrightable and what's the standard for infringement, right? Um, and I guess uh, you know, I kind of come out and lean more copyrightable, but narrow the, or tighten the standard for infringement. And um, uh, I guess all three of you come out in favor of, no, let's just, let's start by um, by just sort of cutting out uh, many of, uh, to some extent, many of the elements of, uh, of musical works. Uh, and then on top of that, you're saying um, heighten the standard for infringement. And uh, uh, Carol, in your case, I mean, I, you started to sound something that sounded more like sort of fair use than an infringement mm. standard mm. because you're saying, you know, even if there's like a, a recognizable, uh, a copying mm -hmm. of a recognizable portion of musical work, and in many other areas we would say, okay, once you have a recognizable string that's long enough, that is prima facie infringing, but then we're going to come up with the, the, the standard of fair use. Um, and we're going to say, if, if, you, if you transform it in such a way that you add something, and also it doesn't, uh, affect the market for the original work, uh, then it's still not fair, right? So um, I, maybe, uh, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth that aren't there, but I'm, I'm curious about whether that, that resonates with your sense of, of, of the analysis. Right, no, it does, and it's, um, however, however, I think that the fact of the matter is um, people like Winston Marsalis never attempt such a theory. The elk you take the melodic content and it's recognizable in the second in the previous iteration of the work, but it doesn't the fact would not be getting the chemical yeah. license or something that you were right. ready to it, it, it is interesting that uh, fair use is so rarely asserted in music cases. Like it's a lot like litigated to to some kind of judgment in music cases, and I, I would, I, I, I'm curious if the, if the actual litigator uh, on the panel um, has, has any thoughts on this, but in these uh, 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 cases where you have song A sounding too similar to song B, um, even in a case where actual copying is, is clear, right, it's so rare, I mean, Campbell, the, um, the uh, uh, 1994, the Supreme Court case, right? That's the exception for me that proved the rule. Like, that was a case uh, where they actually relied on fair use, but all of these cases we're talking about, it's about substantial similarity. You never see defendants 
going to the mat on, on fair use. Um, and I've, I've always wondered why that is. Well, the only one I know of besides Campbell, and, and maybe there are others, is the one in the Southern District of New York against Drake, who used a, a recording of a spoken uh, a spoken word recording at the beginning of the song. And he actually won it, I think on 12b6, not even a, a summary judgment motion. Um, I tend to plead it because one never knows. It, you know, it always seemed to me that that if we're down to a pitch of, you know, sequence of pitches, something generic, and it gets to the point where it's in the jury, you want them to have that tool to say, look, it didn't interfere with the value of the underlying work. It's a small part of it. You know, all those, the four fair use factors, but you don't usually, you know, I've never actually tried that issue in a music case because there's always better issues, you know, <laughs> like there was no access or whatever. And so, but you're right, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and de minimis is another, you know, de minimis is another where, look, if we're only talking about the idea of, of combining, you know, a sequence of five pitches with a chord progression that's been out there forever, then maybe that's not a substantial taking, even if it was a taking. I should say, I, I, there's one thing I want to say before I leave, and I apologize, but I do have a plane to, to catch. You know, with all respect to, <laughs> to Robert, there really aren't a lot of copyright infringement cases over classical music. You know, and, and there's something that, that hasn't been mentioned so far. These are popular music claims, and th they're genres. There's a limited, you know, there's a kind of thing that one does. They have, a, a, you know, underlying beats. Someone mentioned that. And they have very basic kinds of things that that fit in that genre. And so if you start making a list, like one of Robert's points of, well, a synth and, and you know, something else and something else, all these performance elements, you're basically co-opting the genre because, you know, it's going to have certain kinds of things. It's going to have, you know, um, the, the Charleston rhythm in the, in the Dua Lipa case. It's going to have certain things that, that identify the genre and you're, again, and I know I'm harping on this, but you're limiting creativity if you tell someone, okay, if you decide to do something in, in trap, which is a sub, sub, sub genre, if you decide you wanna do something in trap, boy, you're gonna get sued by the guy who did a trap song before if you, you know, so it, it just makes it, you know, both limiting and punitive. You know, being sued is not a fun thing. Um, this has been very enjoyable. I wish I could stay longer, but my flight leaves in less than two hours. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to leave. Thank you very much. Thanks. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, I, I, I hate to respond to fear after it's gone. But, <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, so for me, that, that is a matter of, uh, that's a matter that should be taken care of as a matter of decision analysis. So if, if, if you if you say, um, you know, I don't know whether you want to use sense of fair or what kind of document you're using, but if you say that there's a particular genre and we can identify uh, ten elements that appear in every song in this genre, and we can show you hundreds of songs that have all these ten elements, then obviously um, that 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 you know copying those ten elements should not be the basis of an infringement claim as a matter of. Of, of infringement analysis, but it I, to me at least it's not clear that 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 that's a reason to um, to you know eliminate the whole classes of elements in favor of saying just melody, not anything else um, uh, in music. And and as I said, I I I am a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit dubious about whether we're we're really doing much when we when we say even when we say melody only. Um, as soon as we start asking whether two melodies that are not identical are substantially similar or not, I think we let rhythm and harmony and everything else back in the door um, because I don't think we can we can analyze the similarity of those two without thinking of the, the harmonic and rhythmic and, and so forth context uh, and, and, and imply what's that are implicit in, um, in those melodies. 
So I, I'm not even sure that um, you say limiting to melody, and yet if, if you want to tell, you know, uh, unless you keep it to extremely thin copyright where the two melodies have to be identical. Um, and then, again, what does identical mean? Um, if they're played in slightly different tempos, they're identical. We tend to overlook certain kinds of, of differences. Um, so, I, I, have, yeah. I have something I could, I could say in response yeah, to that. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know if we want to uh, turn Yeah, we should at some point. I mean, I, I don't know. We have not been monitoring the chat. And there may be questions in the chat. And I'm afraid we don't have a machine that is very uh, 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 available to us here. To so, okay. I will. I will. Um, oh, a lot of people saying nobody's not working. Yeah, that would um, be cool. <laughs> okay. Um, so the the one thing I would I would say just in in response to that is um, there's there's another phenomenon that I think has traveled alongside um, the uh, uh, growing definition of what, what counts in a music infringement case, which is the role of experts. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. music is in a really... Which done some work in. Yeah. yeah, well, so music is in a really unusual place in the, uh, um, on the spectrum of copyrightable subject matter where it's, it's just music and software, really, where ex experts play a large role in saying whether uh, a particular kind of copying is substantial or not, um, right? And, and, and pretty much every other kind of subject matter, you might see an expert trying to uh, make some kind of probabilistic assessment of whether the, you can make an inference of copying from the fact of similarity. But in music, like in software, we have experts now talking about, like, is this like a big deal or not? It's like a value judgment. Um, and I think, uh, a, a big reason for why experts have gone from becoming, uh, have gone from being something that you couldn't have to something that you could have to something that was recommended to now something that at least in the Ninth Circuit, uh, the Court of Appeal says you need to have in a music infringement case is the growing complexity of what might support um, a claim. Uh, and I think the the Ninth Circuit is, is at the vanguard right now of uh, trying to weed out some of these fragment claims that we spoke about earlier, where you're really just, you know, the, 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 the Led Zeppelin guitar intro or the, the, what the court called an ostinato in the Katy Perry case. So I think, I, I think the courts are doing a good job of, of coming up with tools to deal with those. It's the blurred lines type cases where you have a series of alleged similarities that run through the whole song. Mm -hmm. That I think even with the infringe, even with Saint Affair um, and uh, um, you know thin copyrights and the other tools that uh, the appeals courts are trying to deploy right now, um, it, it, they're just too complex. And like it, they, more of these cases should be dealt with on summary judgment, one way or the other, um, right? If it's something that like needs to go to a jury, you're not generating some kind of jurisprudence that tells future songwriters, okay, what am I allowed to do? So I, yeah, I, 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 anything that, that, that decreases the role um, of experts in, in these, these cases, in these music cases, I think, I think would be a good thing. Yeah, I think, the, I think the Germans have it right. They, if you don't bring in your own expert, the court will, you know, will determine, will, will find a neutral, presumably neutral expert. There's no battle of, of experts. Um, I think that's a, a far saner uh, approach because, I mean, if you look at the expert, Testimony in these music cases, it's, it's fatuous. There's one, one just arguing what their client wants to say versus versus the other. There's no no meaningful um, uh, musicological analysis. Really, it's it's, uh, it's it's simply another advocacy on the, on right. the part of the, the client. Yeah, rather than pure analysis. I agree with that. Um, the one question that I did want to to ask um, you both is um, whether you agreed with. My premise that there is a hierarchy of dependence among musical acts. If so, shouldn't that affect how we determine protectable musical expression and what is valuable musical expression? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I, I guess I think um, uh, in some musical practices, yes. And, and maybe, you know, one of the answers might be uh, Peter's answer that uh, as a practical matter, music copyright litigation is about popular music and um, I guess most of the popular music that he's talking about does have recognizable melodies because maybe uh, you know, electronic dance music and so on doesn't get in there very much. Um, and um, so if, if that turns out to be the case, then I guess, you know, we'd say, yeah, you know, we could theorize about all these different kinds of musical practices that, for which melody is less important. Uh, but it turns out that the, all litigation is about the musical practices where melody is paramount. Um, and so the, the, the doctrine is, is really going to um, uh, develop around those cases. Um, with that having been said, I, I, I do think that there are, there are many uh, musical practices for which melody is not that important. Um, and again, um, I think we'd have to go into much greater detail also about the extent to which melody is really a subset of pitch sequence. That not every pitch sequence is a melody, um, uh, and you know I think if we were willing to to come to that again, then I, I think we could we could I could pull up we don't have time, but I could pull up works where I think these are beautiful works, but there's really no melody. <laughs> it's it's other stuff that's going on in there. Um, so yeah, I I I don't think I agree that sort of melody is always at the top of the hierarchy of yeah, I think I, I, I think I'm with you. Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm, I'm I'm not yet convinced on everything necessarily for for every kind of work for every for every genre flowing from melody. And I'm I'm thinking in particular of um, some commercially popular music um, where either there isn't really at least a top line melody, or if there is, it's an afterthought. Right, it's like tacked on at the end. Um, so at least like during the course of producing, of composing that music, um, uh, it's, I, I think it would be just inaccurate to say that things depended on it. It was, it was the, the last piece that was, that was put in. Um, so yeah, I think I am not, not on board yet, but um, I would be interested to, to see what the musicological analysis would be in, in the <laughs> cases um, so that thinking, travel through the copyright yeah. system. If we were to get beyond the three uh, primary elements of melody, harmony, and rhythm, and start going down to the timbre and to um, um, instrumentation, um, is it possible mm -hmm. to have a musical work composed simply of timbre and instrument? Of course not. No, of course not. Um, so, so there is a dependence. Well, they come together. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, it's, it's, I, I'm, it's, I'm very interested um, in you know your your sense of the relationship between the visual and the and the sort of auditory in, in, in music and the possibility of a trained musician being able to read a score and in their mind um, come up with a, a satisfying experience without ever ha having to actually hear it. Um, you know, the clip you saw from Salieri. He is imagining an oboe coming in, and then a clarinet, mm -hmm. and those are specific um, sound experiences. And if he had never heard those, reading the score wouldn't help. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think about um, the experience of, of somebody who uh, has been deaf from birth, uh, right? So um, they can. Uh, such person can uh, read um, the English language, and um, they may be missing something because they don't. They don't. Um, they're not. They're not sort of hearing the sounds of the words, and yet you say, "Oh, there's meaning to those words that exist independently of any sound experience." It's. I mean, it's not clear to me that they would have the same experience in reading a score. That if you had not been trained in as a musician and you didn't have the the auditory experience of what that music would sound like, that you would have the imagination. And I think the imagination includes timbre, it includes 
whether this is a, you know, uh, uh, a legato or a staccato mm -hmm. uh, rendering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, so it doesn't seem to me that those are independent. Right, right. But the whole those can be. Yeah, no, can, no. While you're responding, I'm going to take a look at the chat. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's also a hand that's in the room. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Please. Oh, okay. So um, uh, earlier, Mr. Anderson had made a comment about how there's not much legislation in classical music. And I'm wondering if the reason behind that is because you are dealing with a mass market of um, experts and they know how the music, just the, the lay listener perhaps in the classical music genre is a person who can tell the difference between a melody and a descant. So they understand that something that's similar, they, they understand how it's being transformed. I'm trying to figure out, um, and maybe I'm just being law student about this, but um, why is it uh, in litigation, why is uh, the line being drawn at the lay listener when the people who are writing and potentially infringing the music, they're the ones, they're, they're part of the expert class. So I, I'm trying to understand why we're drawing the line in one place when the um, and I'm using air quotes for people who can't see me, um, when the crime is being committed by someone who's operating on a completely different level. They are, they are creating these for the lay audience. It's for a specific, for, for people who are not experts. Right, and, and I, I'm just trying to figure out. The economic value of the work lies. The, the supposed logic, yeah, is that the, 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 the economic worth or value of the work depends upon its, its attraction to lay listeners, yeah. not to the experts. Um, so and intent is never part of this. Correct. I think, that's, I think that's intent. I mean, so knowledge of, of a prior work is important to this because you need to have copied. If you don't have exposure to the work, then, but, but other than that, yeah, I think it's right. To, to your question, I mean, the, I think descriptively, just the reason that we do it that way is because uh, the Second Circuit said that's how we did it in Armstein versus Porter, and everybody else has just followed suit ever since. <laughs> None of this is in the Copyright Act. And the Second Circuit could have said something completely different. We could, copyright can look more patent-like, where we're asking who is a person having ordinary skill in the art, except instead of art being technology, it would mean the arts. Um, right? we, we could have that system. Judges decided that we don't, and now we don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it goes a little beyond uh, Armstein. I think it is baked into the fair use analysis too. That that uh, when we consider, you know, market effect, that we're yeah. we're asking, well, who is the market, and, and, and what's the what's the thing that's happening in the market? So, but yes, I agree. Not in not in the act. Um, so there is a, uh, a, a Q and A here online. Uh, and it says, I'll just read this, I do not follow why equating a musical work to a set of instructions, quote, privileges a performer, unquote. You might argue that it reduces a score to something non-copyrightable like a recipe, but that's a different argument. If you think about how different conductors command extremely different performances, you realize how much latitude there is in a score, but that is so distinct from how theater directors command different, very, very different performances of Oh wait, but is that so different, uh, distinct from how theater producers, uh, directors command different performances of plays? In neither case are we reducing the written work to the point where it's merely an instruction to a performer. Uh, just as a play is both a literary work and a set of instructions, so a score can be a musical work and a roadmap that we follow to recreate the work when we want to play it. Uh, maybe the theater you disagree with that, or um, have any reactions to that uh, that comment? I agree that it, it could be both uh, a for a performer and also a musical work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I, I would say that, yeah, you're, I'd say you're pretty hard to one side on the independence of the score from the, uh, from, you know, from the render, right? Yeah. I would say the value of the score depends in, in, in some measure, maybe a large measure, on its independence from a particular performer. More, it is independent of that performer. The more it's a self, uh, self-preserving, self, uh, self, uh, it, its work is wrapped up in itself, not, uh, not uh, the performer. 
this is why I, I talk about this. I talk about, you talk about top performers, you know, song by, sung by Madonna or Michael Jackson. If I were to sing it, no one would be interested. No one would attend. No one would, no one would be on I, because I'm not Madonna, or my, I'm not those specific people. I don't have their 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 aura, their 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 personality, their their expression. Or, um, however, if I play a sonata by Schubert, um, it's uh, I, you know, I, it's not going to be Murray Pariah, but it's going to be rep, it's going to be you know favorable, and uh, you know somebody might listen to it. Um, and that's because the work is so independent of my performance. It's just a, it's, it's sublime unto itself. It doesn't depend on me to, 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 to make it uh, meaningful and, uh, and uh, perceptible and uh, beautiful to the audience. Hey, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know. We've, we've crossed over from, from uh, rendering on the musical instrument to singing. Singing is, is I think, by far kind of the most personal of performances. And I don't know whether you would say exactly the same thing about an aria um, as, as you might about a, uh, a sonata, right? A sonata has uh, a lot of detail that is kind of baked into uh, the instrument as well. Like, you know, the choices that you're making are, uh, are, are, are quite constrained by the, the way the, the piano is tuned and so on. So I, I don't know. I, it's an interesting, it's an interesting observation. There, there's something else that comes up in, in some of these cases, particularly the, the pre-78 ones, where we're dealing with a deposit copy, um, which which raises a visual evidence issue that I think is different than the one you're talking about. Because I think your point really has to do with uh, uh, what types of elements of a musical work um, tend to be performative and tend to be compositional. But in some of these cases that get litigated, it's the problem isn't so much that like we're misclassifying something as performance rather than composition. It's that the visual text is just much more skeletal than the audio text. Uh, mm -hmm. And if only the uh, the the positive copy, right, spent a lot right, more time, right, transcribing. Um, and, right. and so then it just becomes right. a question of like, what's the best evidence of what the work is, and, mm -hmm. and like. Would you still go to just well if, if, if only what's visual, even though a lot more could have been visual if it were just written down? No, and uh, <laughs> as you remember, I said I said something to the effect of um, uh, into a live performance and um, of our um, uh, visual scores, but also machine-generated audio recording, which is not possible. Maybe technology. That's what I would use. Because that's the that takes the performer out of it entirely. It, and that's it can it can render dynamics, instrumentation, um, you know, volume, tempo, key, mode. The whole I, thing. I think we're going to get to a point where we, we can simulate Michael Jackson's voice pretty, completely well on, on a machine generated performance. And so right. then your then your thinking will disappear. It'll I mean then we're, there'll be we'll be in complete uh, uh, agreement because. The score will contain um, lots of notation that you might not be familiar with, but it's visual notation, mm -hmm. and it ends up uh, it ends up generating uh, a Michael Jackson. No, but my argument would be that you have to have these mechanical uh, um, audio representations based upon a visual score, mm -hmm. a visual evidence that can be then translated through MIDI into an audible thing. Yeah, so I understand, but I mean, visual evidence can include um, very thick annotations to scores. Mm -hmm. I mean, your definition of a score to begin with was quite skeletal, right? It just said some, something like pitches, yep. synchronic, and right. diachronic. That's right. That's right. right. Typical scores contain a lot more than that. They say, here's the instrument that's going to be playing this, right. first of all. Right. And then they say, here's how to play it. And yeah. here's here's how to you know here's the dynamics here's when it gets louder here's when it gets right. here's when it gets um, and farther down the food chain you go though 